Thank you for staying with us. You're still watching The Breakfast on PLUS TV Africa. It's time to take global stories making headlines in our national dailies. And joining me to review the papers is Professor Camilo Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. Good morning, Prof. Thank you for joining us. Good morning and happy Easter. Yes, happy Easter to you. Hope you've had a wonderful celebration. I mean, I know you're Muslim, but oh, this yeah. is a good public holiday. Yes, it's a public holiday. And it's a very long one. Mm -hmm. Weekend plus uh, Friday weekend and now Monday, you know. Right. All this stretch. Yeah. I mean, it's, I'm sure it's lovely for everyone just to reset and then we get back into the, the work pool tomorrow again. All right, let's move over to the papers. And um, we'll be starting with a daily trust this morning. Um, the major headline on this one says, Kebi residents loot government private warehouses. And the writers on this one says, palliatives not solution to hardship. And that has been said by the Bayosa governor. Another writer says, um, Kuka charges Tinubu on food and physical security. What do you think about this? I mean, people are taking matters into their own hands. They're moving into um, warehouses. We saw what happened a few months ago where some people went to some warehouses in Abuja and looted it. Now, you're seeing another one happen in Kebi. Is this, you know, going to be what we're, what we're going to be seeing in a few months? Different states, different people going to loot warehouses because of the hardship. And even one of the governors is saying, you know what, palliatives is not the solution. Obviously, we need more lasting, sustainable solutions for the hardship in Nigeria. But I want to just get your take on this. What do you think about what's going on? You see, what is going on is uh, an indicator to the government uh, that uh, the public is not happy with uh, the situation. And the best thing for the government is to try to head up uh, uh, this uh, uh, unfortunate trend. If they allow it, it is likely going to happen in the uh, so many places. There is a problem what is known as copycat syndrome. You know, something happens somewhere and people will copy it in another place. So the thing is that uh, the government ought to listen to the people and uh, know that this issue of uh, hardship is a reality. Uh, they shouldn't just be talking of calling on people to sacrifice the light is there in the, uh, the end of the tunnel. And uh, yeah, something has to be done. You know, the government has to be seen there to be doing something uh, immediately. And um, I've said this several times that uh, the problem is that the government is in denial. Uh, they keep on denying the fact that the policies taken uh, would plunge the country into this situation. So it is not a bad thing if the government will. Uh, uh, reverse its own position and address the situation. Otherwise, what we are seeing now might have been just a, a tip of the iceberg, which is unfortunate, and uh, I think uh, the leaders ought to uh, think seriously about this uh, situation. Hmm. Okay, so I want to take another one, which is still talking about the um, hardship and the security. And this one is um, ACF. In fact, they're saying that we should, they're urging Nigerians, rather, since it's the Easter season, they're urging Nigerians um, to pray for security and the economy. Now, this is on Daily Trust. On the punch as well, um, there's another one there that just, you know, still talks about this. What do you think? Do you think prayers is the, is, the, is, the, is the case? I mean, I want to believe that Nigerians are one of the most prayerful people in the world. In fact, we have so many churches. We have so many mosques. Um, we, we're quite religious people. Do you think prayer is the case? Because if we're thinking about prayers, I mean, all our prayers should have been answered by now. In fact, we would have had like one of the best nations in the world. But then we keep praying and we're not seeing actions. So... 
is prayer supposed to be the key or we need leaders who can rise up to the challenge and say, you know what, we want to make Nigeria better. We want to ensure that we're giving um, good education to our kids. We want to ensure that there's great infrastructure in, in the country. We want to give good health care. We want to just make the lives and, prop and properties of Nigerians secured. You know, we want to make the economy thriving for everyone, for businesses to flourish. But then we all come together and say we're praying we're praying we're praying and nothing is being done i want to get your take on this one you see prayer is just a uh, part of it uh, it uh, takes uh, more than a prayer uh yes we are supposed to pray for uh, you know a better situation but at the same time we have to work for it because um uh, whether in, in islam or in christianity or in any religion you just don't sit down and pray without taking any action so we have a belief that god help those who help themselves so we have to have a leadership that to take uh, the bull by the horn and take positive steps in order to address this situation but saying we just pray we pray we keep on we keep on praying but uh, people will lose hope because um god will not send uh, you know the solution directly uh, you know to us uh, we, we have to also work in order to make sure we achieve what we want so i think it's a combination of so many things there should be prayer and there should be work and there should be good leadership that to translate all this into positive action so that the lives of the people will be uh, improved. Mm. So speaking about good leadership, on the punch, the major headline says, Easter, governors, senators beg Nigerians, say hardship would be over soon. Hardship over, over soon. Um, and the writers on this one says, Tinubu will steer Nigeria to greatness, says Zulam. Other governors preach love, condemn crimes. Another um, writer says, set deadline on war against terror. Kuka tells president, Pope seeks peace in, uh, in Africa. So, well, uh, our governors and, and senators are begging us, saying that hardship will be over soon. But I wonder when, because this is, well, 11 months, because now we're in April. So this is 11 months into the Tinubu-led administration. And for almost a year, we've been sacrificing, we've been taking on this hardship, and we've been hearing that things will get better. We will, so, uh, we'll still, we'll soon start to see the dividends, you know, of all of the policies that have been put in place at the moment. But people are dying, people are hungry, people are still facing um, all of this hardship. So I'm wondering when. Because if the governors and senators are coming and saying the hardship will be over soon, I expect to see a timeline. I expect to see... Um, agendas i expect to see things that have been set aside and say you know what this is how we're going to achieve all of this but i'm not saying that so uh, maybe you know more than me i mean you just tell me what you think are we going to be seeing this hardship over soon or is still something we have to bear for the next few months or yes maybe you see, you see the, the, the irony of it is that the people are now beginning to disbelieve uh, the leadership. There is a, a, a trust gap between the people and the leadership. You know, this call that uh, the issues uh, will be over very soon. Um, one, there is a problem that there is no concrete step taken to address the situation, which the, the people now believe. Secondly, the people believe that the leadership ought to lead by example. They are saying people should sacrifice and there is no sign of sacrifice on the leadership. You know, we have said it over and over that, look, in a situation like this, there should be, you know, the attempt to cut unnecessary expenses. But the leaders are calling on the people and yet they are, you know, wallowing in the poverty. The people are wallowing in poverty and the leaders are extravagant in terms of uh, what they spend, their budget and so on. And the sad aspect of it is that uh, people don't believe <coughs> that the governors and the senators and the, indeed the leadership are in what they call. Because now we have Easter. If you look at a uh, majority of the governors who now call this, they didn't come to address to the people, 
They just send the uh, press people to do it, which means there is no concern, there is no empathy from the leadership, mm. that, you know, to uh, the Palawashi. If you look at the story, actually all the governors that said it, I say, except for about three, they, they are the ones who personally address their own uh, people. But all the rest sent it through their press uh, uh, secretary or whatever for the calling. So which means they are not sincere in terms of that. And you know, words have meaning. They have meanings, a uh, ordinary meaning that you have it, and they have meaning who said it, and they have meaning when was it said. So if the person will just send an errant person to address, if the governor, for example, will just send his press person and say, address the people, people will not believe that the governments and the leaders are sincere. Because if they are, they should come out and address the people, and they should show them concrete steps that they want to take in order to do it. And thirdly, they should sacrifice so that when they call people to sacrifice, the people will know that uh, this is coming from the bottom of the leadership mind. Exactly, because if you're telling the Nigerian people to sacrifice, you should also be able to sacrifice with your cost of governance. I mean, um, I'll commend the president for saying, you know, no more foreign travels for the next three months. But I think three months is quite short. And imagine saving five billionaire in three months. Imagine what would happen if we say, OK, for one year or two years because we're trying to grow the economy. So you can't just ask people to sacrifice. Meanwhile, you're not trying to do anything from your own end. At the end of the day, we're all Nigerians. So if everyone needs to sacrifice, we should all sacrifice. If anyone needs to spend lavishly, we should all enjoy the dividends and spend lavishly. Not just picking and choosing and saying, you know what, I'm okay to spend as I want and you have to be on the other side and just sacrificing so I can enjoy, you know, the lavish spending that you cannot. Um, anyways. <laughs> I'm going to move over to another story. And this one says, um, banks are euro bonds, foreign investors for 4 trillion um, naira fresh capital. So as you know, the CBN had put out a directive for banks to recapitalize. In fact, it used to be 25, or rather currently it's 25 billion naira, but now it's being moved to 500 billion naira. Uh, in 2005, um, Soludo, when he was the CBN governor, moved it from 2 billion to 25 billion and now we're seeing it move up to 500 billion because obviously 2005 the the, the price of naira to dollar is definitely different from now and so we're seeing banks having to recapitalize but it's been said that about 12 banks might you know not be able to and so other banks are eyeing the euro bonds um for foreign investors to you know just come in and help them what do you think about the 500 billion um naira recapitalization for the banking sector you see uh, the, the, the thing is that we don't take lesson from what happened in the past Mm. When uh, you know, it, uh, the government told the central bank called for recapitalization uh, during Solodo's time, many banks went uh, down under. And now, uh, we uh, the raising of uh, it to now 500 billion, uh, like you said, about 12 will not make it, which means the industry will suffer. That is one thing. Mm. Secondly, those who think they are going to invite you know, foreign uh, capital in, in investors to come. I think that is a dangerous thing. We know what happened and we know we are not bearing the brunt of, you know, borrowing and borrowing. So I think the leadership, the central bank ought to uh, learn a lesson from what happened and uh, they shouldn't be desperate, you know, trying to have a solution that you raise it. What will it take when you raise it to 500 billion? It will just say the capital has uh, raised and you now put others down and now you invite others to come and we are literally mortgaging the economy to uh, foreign investors because they will come with a very few amount of dollars and they will invest and they will wreck all benefits that uh, they will get because by the time you do it, you are literally, you know, uh, downgrading your own economy, you are literally, you know, empowering others to come. Instead of, you know, the government to come out and see how do we now look at uh, making Nigerians better. They are investors and progress. We are now raising it beyond their capacity.
capacity, you are now making it possible for foreigners to come and invest and still control the economy. And you know their interest is not in Nigeria. Their interest will be in the profit they are going to make. And so we will be going down under you know, with stable policy. So I think this, to me, is, is not a good policy. It is something that uh, at the end of it, uh, it will have more negative impact than positive contribution to our own economy. Okay. Um. Staying on, okay, no, so I'm going to move over to The Guardian. And The Guardian leads with, all thefts persist in Niger Delta despite militarization, private security. So we've heard um, of oil theft happening in various um, Niger Delta regions. You're seeing bunkering. Um, you're seeing people just stealing. In fact, you even hear of ships or um, um, cargo ships being stolen like with so much crude. But what do you think about this? If we're saying that we want to be able to um, help the economy, because if we're being honest, majority of our funds comes from crude. So if we're saying that we want to help the economy, why is there still all theft happening? And why is that nothing? Because now we're seeing private security, we're seeing mil militarization um, in that region, but then they're still stealing. So who, who's, who's giving them the papers? Who's sanctioning this? Who's you know, doing what is necessary to curb all, all thefts? I'm just wondering, because if you have private security, you'd expect that you know, it should be reduced by now, but it's still persisting in the Niger Delta region. So I'm just wondering what's going on. And at this point, isn't this a case of corruption? Because if, for instance, there is one boss there that is supposed to ensure that this doesn't happen and it's still happening, is it that maybe his, his hands are soiled? That's just my question. Why do you think oil theft is still persisting in the Niger Delta region? No, you hit the nail right on the head. It's corruption. Uh, it's because of the corruption in the sector. That is why all these things uh, you know, have, we have been trying and there is no uh, relative success in terms of addressing the situation. So I think corruption is the major reason why we are having it and uh, it is going to persist unless we have the political will uh, to address the issue of corruption in that uh, uh, sector and in the economic sector in general. You know, there are instances when some uh, ships were uh, arrested and quickly uh, they will set them on fire. Uh, you know, the official, either the military or the security agencies will set it on fire. And the, the thing is they are trying to cover their own track so that if immediately the evidence is destroyed, you cannot be able to now address I and mean, investigate and find who are the culprits. That is one thing. Secondly, is the fact that there are scapegoats, you know, sacred goods in the a, a, a secret cows rather in the place. You know, the government with all its own security agencies know very well who and who are involved in that because uh, uh, of the impunity with which we conduct uh, issues uh, and corruption in Nigeria, that is why we cannot uh, be able to resolve it, despite the presence of uh, uh, private security agencies. After all, even having private security agencies is a contradiction. Why do we have our own security agents? And they are being paid by the taxes, uh, taxpayers' money, and yet you now have private security agencies aside from that. Other countries, we are not the only one producing oil. Other countries have been able to address uh, this issue, and we have said it like um, Saudi Arabia, Today, if a barrel of uh, oil is uh, being stolen, they will see it immediately and they will take action. But here we are, now we find even refineries are uh, down. We find so many things and the uh, ship uh, you know, uh, will come take our own oil and go. And in fact, I think um, one of, uh, I don't know, I can't recall who said it, but she said, about 50% of Nigerian oil is being stolen. So how can you get that much of uh, oil being stolen? And then the government said it's unaware of who is involved. So I think the question is, uh, 
the gargantuan uh, corruption that is uh, existing in the area. So that is why we cannot and we are not able to address the uh, problem. All right. Um, so staying on The Guardian, we have one here that says CSOs, that's the um, civil society organization, right? CJN laments poor state of judiciary. What do you think about this? Um, they say, you know, some of the judges are not well paid. Um, and then even the judiciary is just in a poor state. What do you think about this one? The CSOs are writing the CJN and just lamenting about this. Yeah, I think it's, it's true. It's a reality that, uh, uh, to me, uh, just uh, poor pay is just one element, but it is also the corruption that uh, is, uh, a, uh, you know, pervasive in Nigeria. That is why the judiciary is also weak, because uh, corruption is used to buy, uh, you know, uh, judgment. And uh, some, uh, you know, uh, some judges are willing, uh, you know, uh, to, to sell judgment for that, whether it is an election issue or even on private matters or on so many things. And the dangerous aspect of it is that, is that so long as the judiciary is weak, the people will lose hope in it. And if they do, that is an anarchy, I mean, a recipe for anarchy. Because by the time people uh, lose trust in or confidence in the judiciary, what will happen is that uh, they will take the law into their own hands and uh, will, it will be dangerous for everybody in Nigeria. It will not overwhelm for any, everybody in Nigeria. So I think the call by the CSO is in the right direction that uh, the government look, ought to look into this uh, situation. It is not just to, uh, you know, give them a uh, fair race. No. It is to establish the uh, uh, judiciary as an autonomous and the independent aspect of the government. So long as it is subservient to other arms of government, so long there is corruption, we are going to have what I said, you know, people are uh, losing confidence in it and, uh, and trust, and uh, we are going to see people taking the law into their own hands, which is a dangerous thing for the country and for everybody in Nigeria. Mm. Okay. So Sarah has um, asked the 36 state governors and the minister of the FCT to publish their um, everything they've done with the loans that they've received. And so on The Guardian, it says, Sunny, Wiki, others get ultimatum to publish agreements accounts for 5.9 trillion naira and $4.6 billion loans. What do you think about this with Sarah asking them to ensure that they, they publish this? In fact, this was one of our top trending stories, and I talked about accountability and transparency. And the fact that there is a you know, trust deficits with Nigerians and the government because we can't not trust you. We just feel like you're spending the money lavishly and um, we can't really ascertain what all the loans are for. I mean, loans are good, but that's when you're trying to do something great with it. For instance, if you have a business, you're trying to expand. And so we're seeing, you know, these state governors getting loans, but we cannot really ascertain what it's for. And we need some um, level of transparency and they need to be accountable as well to be able to say, this is what we're using this money for. And now Serap is coming out and issuing an ultimatum that they have to do this. What do you think about what um, Serap is championing at the moment? Yeah, that is, that is part of uh, a democracy. You know, the hallmark, uh, one of the hallmarks of uh, democracy is the issue of transparency and accountability of the leadership to uh, the electorate. So what uh, they are calling, the CSO is calling, I think that is a right thing. And uh, we need to have that one. After all, uh, we have the freedom of information uh, law uh, that, uh, you know, the governors have to uh, and the government or the leadership have to make this thing available uh, to the public. Otherwise, if everything is shrouded in mystery, like the way we are seeing it, uh, you know, uh, there will be so much corruption around the issue. You can notice a public uh, leader, a public figure, borrow money and now refuse to make it known to the uh, people. So I think that is uh, a good step what um, will put the leadership on their toes 
And uh, that is one good aspect of uh, with the CSOs in general, that uh, since other an element of the government is weak, uh, the, the legislature, which is... Okay, the legislature is supposed to exercise its own oversight function uh, on the issue, and uh, in addition, the, the judiciary is supposed to check these things. But uh, like we said earlier on, these are relatively weak compared to uh, the executive arm. So I think um, it, we need uh, the CSOs to take uh, this issue so that uh, they do it on, on behalf of uh, you know, the, the people. Otherwise, we are not likely going to see um, you know, the system responding to the young and aspirations of Nigeria. So I think we need strong CSOs, and not only the call, but if they do, let the, the judiciary and whatever institution that is supposed to take action, let them take action to post the executive to now reveal uh, what uh, they have been doing, or how much have been borrowed, and what, uh, uh, how much has been spent, and where has it been spent, and so on. So that there will be transparency and openness, and there will be accountability on all these things. Otherwise, we are going to have mountains of debt, and after the, the governors have gone, then we start uh, rambling, like, what is happening? Now he can, he can, you know, he is uh, saying that uh, he has inherited mountains of debt, and the governor is in denial. The former governor is in denial, and he personalizes. So I think what the uh, what Sarah is doing is a good thing, and I will urge all other CSO also to take such measures in order to compel the leaders to be account to give account of what they borrowed and uh, how they spend it. All right. Thank you so much. Um, I just want to touch on Nature News. I mean, you don't have to comment, but this one on Nature News says why Abuja's smart city remains a dream 14 years after. And I'm just wondering um, why we take so long when it comes to projects. You know, they come and they sell these lofty ideas to you, but then um, executing them takes a while or doesn't even happen at all. Anyways, we want to thank you, Professor, for coming um, and just sharing your valuable contributions on the show. Thank you so much. Thank you very much for having me. All right. Enjoy your day. We've been speaking with Professor Camille Sanifage. He's from the Department of Political Science, Bayero University, Kano. And we've just been reviewing the papers. We'll go on a short break. And when we return, we're looking at our first hot topic. Please stay with us.